the Bank of Ireland in College Green is getting a bit of a clean up. Our come back Speaker Connolly and see our old Parliament shining like silver in the Dublin sunshine. Hibernia and the statues on top are getting a facelift and Hibernia herself is having a new arm. <whistles> Professor Donald Murphy made a model in plaster of Paris of the old arm. And Paddy Rowe, the king of Irish stonecutters, is doing a bang on job carving out the arm and heads in his workshop up in the Dublin mountains. Paddy comes from a long line of stonecutters. His father Tom and his grandfather I and his grandfather too, going back for centuries, keeping up the stone cutting tradition all around Glan Cullen, Bally Blue, Barnacullia, and Bally Edmonds Duff. It's near Dab Hand putting out the fingers there. That's Portland stone, came all the way from the Isle of Portland. You know, at one time the ships coming into Dublin Bay used to throw that into the Liffey. They were carrying it as ballast. And when the ships came into the harbour, they were too heavy to come in and they dumped off the Portland stone. But you see, it's a nice soft limestone and some genius discovered that it was a grand job for sculpting and how right he was. But sometimes it's full of white horses and when that happens, it crumples into dust and lumps like the cop candy we used to buy in Woolers when we were children. Here's Paddy now. It's not often you see a man with three arms crossing college green. Hibernia looking down at them traffic lights holding up the arm. But your Hibernia, you've been waiting 150 years for this arm. You can afford to wait a little longer. You see, the Dublin weather plays havoc on the old Portland stone. It's all right now, Hibernia. Here it is, it's all in the bag for you. Up you go. Well, you look at Christy Dunn. He should have been a tightrope walker instead of a labourer. Great head for heights, Christy. Now, if you or I tried to do that across the street, we'd probably fall and break the arm. Not Christy. There it is. Safe and sound. Mr. Flynn has the unveiling job done for the big moment. It's not every day of the week that a lady gets a new head and a new arm. I'd say Hibernia is going to be very proud tonight, sitting up there on the top of the Bank of Ireland in all our glory, looking down at all the motor cars and the buses and looking down at the back of Mr. Grattan's neck. Now, Fidelity, don't be jealous, didn't you get a new face as well? Everything has to be fitted into precision measurement. Janie Mack, she's getting a new harp as well. She'll be in right style before the week is out. But I think she wants the arm on first. Of course, or she would never be able to play the harp without having the alarm in order. Uh oh, Goldsmith and Bourke in the front garden at Trinity discussing Hibernia's face. It's a pity Mr. Grattan can't see her, but he never seems to turn around. Hey, Mr. Grattan, turn around there, Mr. Grattan. There's a fine looking woman behind you. Getting a manicure now to finish her off nicely. And Miss Commerce with a new face and a smashing permanent wave.
Walsh's granite quarry. That was aiming, drilling the holes. I'm getting ready now to cut out a block of granite. The metal feathers are inserted into the holes and the plugs are put in. And the tapping will start now any second. There we go, with the music on the xylophone. But you know, the quarry men are very skilled men. They're all craftsmen to their fingertips. You know the way the birds pick the right straw and the right moss for the nest? Well, the quarry men cut the granite out of the exact spot in the bed of the quarry. Here's the crowbars in now. Colin Walsh, Tom Glennon and Eamon getting this hunk of granite out. But you look at the traditions they have. The skills of the Doyles and the Shakespeare's and the Morgans and the Malones. There was that many of the Doyles that worked the stone, but they had to have nicknames for them. The flyer dial, the hairspan dial, the tosser dial, the dresser, the gigger, the daddy dial. And then there was the Malones, Jem, the Jem Malone, the Weasel Malone, the Peddler Malone, and a whole host of names. Okay. This is the forge. At one time, they had a blacksmith to do this job, but the stone cutters today make their own tools. This is called upsetting the punch and drawing it out on the point. I wonder is that where the word upset came from? Upsetting the tool. The unions gave the stone cutters a half an hour to make their tools and to sharpen their tools. Put back into the fire there, drawn out, and dipped into the quencher. But watch this now. Dipped in, quickly withdrawn, rubbed on the ground. Because if they didn't do that, the temper would go right up the punch. And of course, when it would meet the granite, it would snap off. So it has to be precision tempered all the way. Tom Glennon working on a granite altar for a church up in County Monaghan. Tom is known in the trade as the finest cutter of letters. I and his father before him. Tom served his time with the famous Michael Biggs. The old December brush has many uses. Rainwater today and baptismal water tomorrow. Ball knocking, as our Wickler neighbours call it, across the Blessington Lake, nesting at the foot of the hills. This is the stone cutter's territory. Is that the shadow of a magic carpet I see passing over Creedence Quarry? This is Osborne and Brady country, working away at the granite surrounded by spall heaps, standing like megalithic cairns and prehistoric graves, memorials in stone, in the words of John Ruskin, to the genius of the unassisted workman. Aye, surely the ghosts of the Bournes and the McAvoys 
And the ghosts of all the great stonecutters, the Edward Smiths, the John O'Shea's, the Seamus Murphy's, pass by this way at night time. Balti Boy's graveyard, the final resting place of the remains of all the stone cutters. Many of them who designed and cut their own stones several years before their deaths. But their stones will live on. She had never passed down a road or a street or a graveyard without seeing the work of all the great stone carvers and cutters of Ireland. Here's one now for the family album. Watch the dicky board. The lady in the centre is Mrs Annie Kane, 94 years old, the widow and daughter of a stonecutter. These are all stonecutters from Barnacola. Well, you go in there and get your man, or he won't be in this photograph and he'd be cutting his throat in the morning. Now, everybody right. OK, this way, Tiggy. There's one side blocked off. Okay. Plenty of young children there to carry on the stone-cutting tradition. Dog and all in on the act. Here's one out of the album. A group of Irish stone-cutters photographed in Wales in 1910. I'm sure I suppose in a hundred years' time they'll be taking another photograph out and naming them off the way they're naming them off here today. The Malones, the O'Neills, the Bully Kelly. They say he was a tough man. And here's more names. Workmen's accounts, the 10th of October, 1914. All present and correct, clocked in for six days' work. The Stonecutters Union is now in session. Mr. James Carroll in the chair. Will you read the minutes of the last meeting, please? John Kelly was asked about taking John Ryan as an apprentice to the stone lapping. But should the site he had decided time and time again that no outsiders can be admitted. After all, wasn't there a swarm of stonecutters' children who might go into the drapery business? And besides, the outsiders would reduce prices or maybe become employers. Dublin's Custom House, James Gandon's glory. I burn you there on top, watching the ships coming into the Dublin port. Edward Smith's riverheads, representing the 13 principal rivers in Ireland and the Atlantic Ocean. The central bank some fine carved stonework around the doorway. How about that for a work of art? The carved capitals on the old Munster and Leinster Bank in Dame Street. And a nice bit of shamrock there for St. Patrick's Day.
John O'Shea's monkeys. They're playing that game down in the Kildare Street Club for the last 125 years. Phil O'Neill, the pride of Barnacolia, designing a rosette on white Carrara marble. That marble comes all the way from northern Italy. Look at that. And you thought crafts when we're dead. This is the side piece of a mantelpiece. And in a second or two, you'll see the center piece. There's the center now getting a rub down with the felt to give it that nice polished finish. Now that's a job that would please the eye of Bossy and Adam. The Stapletons and the Wests and all them people could nearly come back to Dublin and see all the skills being carried out today under the expert eye of a Dublin craftsman. Mica sparkling in raw granite and the same granite after dressing, cutting and cleaning. Paddy McHugh and Christy Dawn setting a granite block in the wall of the Bank of Ireland. Paddy too comes from a long line of stone cutters. In fact, his father was in that photograph that we were looking at. It was taken back there in 1910. There will spirit level up now. How about that for craftsmanship? George Flynn. Born and reared in Balnockan. Grouting the end there of an ionic column at one time was the entrance to the House of Commons in the Parliament in College Green. Today it's the way in to deposit your few bob in the Bank of Ireland. Punching out the eroded Portland Stone. The Brady Brothers, Kit and Joe, a lifetime in the trade. They will foot protection there. Cleaning up pilasters there with the chisel and the wooden mallet. They will smoke and boasting a chamfer on the Bank of Ireland in College Green. Egg and dart design. And a smooth finished column. We leave Sir Edward Lubbock Pierce's beautiful design and move across the street to the design of Mr. Keane and Mr. Sanderson, Trinity College, Dublin. Trinity 
is getting new cobblestones and sets in Parliament Square. It got its name because the Parliament across the street put up the few shillings to buy the cobblestones in the 18th century. That's Charlie Boyle laying the sets. And the young apprentices learning the skills from the two elder craftsmen. Paddy Healy and Paddy McArdle, who have laid sets and cobblestones all over Ireland and England. And when these sets come up, or these cobblestones come up in a hundred or a hundred and fifty years' time for redressing, there'll be no danger of finding any human bones the way Paddy and the lads found them on this occasion. Oh, the human bones were there for all to see, sitting over on the Campanile between divinity and law. the right face, Paddy. Sand and shadows. Oh, an American sightseers to see the book of Kells and the stony carpet. The boys are getting on well with the trade. Certainly getting good training. Cleaning off a set stone. These sets came from Smithfield Haymarket and up around the Black Church. Charlie Boyle laying sets. Aren't stones wonderful things? And isn't it wonderful what men can do with them? But you can do anything with them. There was a Greek fellow one time who put them in his mouth as he ran along the seashore to practice elocution. Now you can't beat the old stones. For beautiful language, beautiful designs, beautiful walls, and beautiful stony carpets. It's a field day in Barnacullia, and we give the final bow to the lady, Mrs. Annie Kane, the reigning queen of a Dublin stone cutting family. <laughs>